Hello. What follows is uh, an interview I conducted with Bomber Command Wireless Operator Jack Bromfield back in, in 2011. Um, Jack served on Halifaxes with 158 Squadron and was shot down in January 1945. He gives us a, a good insight into the training process for a wireless operator, the characteristics of the Halifax, the use of a device uh, called Fishbond, and, and describes the night he was shot down. Uh, indeed, after the war, he, he sent a talked about sending Christmas cards to the Luftwaffe pilot who shot him down. He discusses his invasion, the capture, his incarceration, and his, his POW uh, experiences. Jack was a, a great friend of the author, Steve Bond, and Steve kindly wrote up Jack's story for our book, Fighting High, uh, Bomber Command, Failed to Return. I hope you enjoyed Jack's story. If you like hearing veteran stories, then please subscribe to our channel. There's plenty more veteran interviews available uh, through that channel. Uh, and over to Jack. I wanted to be an engine driver. I wanted nothing else. I spent all my time sitting by the railway bank or with my dad in the sheds. And when I told him I wanted to be an engine driver, he said, you are not going to be an engine driver. <clears throat> and he said, you'll be a cleaner boy, a fireman, a driver, finish. He said, if you go into the traffic department, he said, the sky's the limit. You can finish up as the station master at Euston, which was the top job. He said, it's endless in traffic, but loco, Nothing. Well, that hurt when he said, you aren't going. So I, at the time, I worked in the telegraph office on Bletchley Station. And I was the train reporting boy. And I worked a three shift system. When I was on two to ten one day, without their knowledge, I got a quarter fare and I went to Northampton. I walked up Bridge Street, walked into the... Uh, recruiting office and said I want to join the Air Force and they said come inside you know <laughs> he said volunteer and he said what do you want to do I said I want to be air crew and uh, not long after that I had a, a telegram come which said I'd got to go to Crofton Rooms at Bedford you know I don't know you know the main drag you go mm -hmm. over the river and up the main drag yeah and you turn right and there's a um, big cinema or used to be mm -hmm. there well next to there was Crofton Rooms which was like a, a small hall and sitting behind the desk was Colonel Blimp I, you know I, I didn't believe what I was seeing the moustache and, and everything <laughs> yeah. Colonel Blimp and he said uh, there's some damn fine regiments in the British Army you know you can practically take your choice boy and I said, what? And I'm dressed in an air training course sergeant's uniform. Oh, another one of those. And I said, yeah. And that was it. I took the medical. And the medical was poor compared to the railway medical, especially the eyesight medical for the railway. It was, it was you know, anybody could have got through, but not the railway medical. So uh, by this time, I'd been an volunteer another one came and it said be prepared to go to Cranfield for three days and two nights to assess your uh, fitness and ability to become air crew. So I went to Cranfield because I worked in the telegraph office it was all landline system and it was called a double plate sounder and instead of being longs and shorts it was left and right so these little hammers were in a mahogany box with, with a hammer hitting on a brass plate. So the letter B in Morse is dash dot dot dot. These it was left, right, right, right. But you can soon change it to Morse. So when I took my Morse test at, at uh, Carlington, I was going along fine and uh, the bloke in charge of 
sergeant said, it's all right young man, you can put your pencil down now. And he said, where do you work? Hang on a minute. No, that's yours. That's mine with the yeah. lipstick. No, that's yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. You got him? Okay, yeah. I'll, be back. I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a little while. Okay. And uh, he said, uh, where do you work? And I said, telegraph office on Bletchley Station. He said, uh, well, your educational is a bit below par because I only went to an elementary school. I didn't go to grammar or secondary or whatever. He said, but uh, we're willing to take you on as a wireless operator air gunner. And I thought, God, Bromfield, you're in. And I said, yeah. He said, do you accept? I said, yes, I'll accept. Well, when that telegram came, my father said, what's that? I said, I've got to go for another medical. And I think something clicked, but he didn't say anything. And then I had another one from uh, King George, you know, in the old buff envelope. And it said, uh, report to number one aircrew receiving centre, Lord's Cricket Ground, St John's Wood. And he said, what the... And railway language for about five minutes, he didn't stop. And I said, well, if you'd let me go on the footplate, Pops, I said, I would have still been here, but now I'm going in the Air Force. And he <coughs> said, well, he said, I've only got myself to blame, haven't I? I said, no, that's fact, Dad. Because you could talk to my dad, man to man, not boy to dad. You talked man to man to my dad. And uh, so he said, when do you go? I said, and showed him the date. He said, God, he said, your mother will go mad. And I said, well, you'll have to take the brunt of it, won't you, because it's your fault. <laughs> how, how old were you uh, at this point? I was about 18. So this was about 1942 sort of time, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So the war had been going yeah. for three years. Did yeah. you have any brothers or uh, anyone involved in military at all? I had my elder brother died. Pro before uh, He was war. 11 when right. he died in 1919. He apparently fell on some railings and got blood poison. Right. And just, he died. Yeah. Well, another one going in the Air Force in a not too salubrious position for long life, mm. it, it upset them rather, but they accepted that they had made the mistake. Was your father involved in the First World War? No, no, he was in reserve occupation, you see, steam yes. locomotives. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, it went all, mum, mum went potty. But I've got a younger sister, and I've got a younger, much younger brother. Now, he served two years national service in the Royal Air Force as an officer's mess waiter at Jerby. He was on holiday in the Isle of Man for two years. So you went to... So I went to... It wasn't too popular, but you went to Lords. I went to Lords. Yeah. And I lived in Grove Court, just off uh, Maida Vale. You know where the Beatles made their music? Mm -hmm. In Abbey Road, yeah. Abbey Road Studios. Well, on the other side of the road was a big, um, was Abbey Lodge, a big block of flats. And that was the RAF Medical Centre. And uh, I got kitted out in there. I was in there for about three weeks I was at there and I was posted to number 19 initial training wing at Bridge North in Shropshire and that was about an eight week course. Most of it was square bashing but there was a fair bit of morse and uh, some blokes were not going to make it as wireless ops. You know they got to a certain stage about 12 words a minute and just could not read any farther, any faster. So uh, I went through, uh, I went through with a couple of good mates and we went to Bridge North. That was, that was a nice station that was, but it was weird. Because you, you know Bridge North, High Town and Low Town. Well in them days, High Town did not speak to Low Town. They were, you know, different, <laughs> different tribe I suppose. Yeah. I did eight weeks uh, at initial training week. Then we were posted on block to number two radio school at Yatesbury, which was a 26 week course. <coughs> Pardon me. The uh, 
it was actually, I think it was 13 weeks the first piece, then a week's leave, and then 12 weeks the next part of your course. Uh, the uh, first segment of that before the week's leave was really push, 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 push. You know, they were churning guys through. But also, the, uh, the didn't make it guys had two chances because the course came in every two weeks and the uh, exams then, you had a chance. You were FT'd, further training. Now, two FT's and you were out. And but the basic 30 men on the course stayed the same because you still had 30 men in the 30 man billet because there were guys coming back and guys going out. And uh, if you finished in the top three, you went straight forward for a commission. After that, you were a buck sergeant and I was a buck sergeant. I missed the commission by two. And from there, we had a, uh, a leave and then I was posted to number eight bombing and gunnery school at Evanton, which is about 45 miles north of Inverness. And I thought, Gordon Bennett, how long is it going to take me with trains as they are? So I thought, ding, 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 I'll go and see him on the station because I didn't know where Edmonton was, to be quite sure. And they had a book, and it was about that wide and a lot longer and about that thick, and it had every railway station in the country printed in this big book. So I found out where it was, <coughs> and I thought, now this is the time. The Down Inverness stops in Bletchley about 7 o'clock in the evening. And he will work through, the coaches will go right through to uh, Inverness. So I went to see the station master. He said, good God, young man, you'll never get on that train. And I said, why not? He said, well, we're naval officers and Matlows all going to Scapa Flow. And I thought, well, that's a, a bit rough. And I said, well, couldn't I ride in the guards van? <sighs> oh, no. So I said, well... Can you ring the traffic department at Crewe and just see if I can? I said it would be worth a shout, wouldn't it, than me change at Crewe, change at Glasgow and change at somewhere else. Anyhow, eventually I got on the on the down Inverness and that was 12 hours travelling there by train. And anyhow, I got there. I did eight weeks gunnery. <coughs> In Anson's, fitted with uh, a Bristol Blenheim turret, which only had 45 degrees of travis. And if you wanted another couple of degrees, you put your foot on a foot pedal and just the guns moved. The turret didn't move. So you're squinting out of your good eye and trying to <laughs> hit something that's floating about on the end of a wire. But it was. It was good training and the point was they wanted you to do well and they helped you, they really did. But I didn't fancy them guys job on them martinets towing that drove with these idiots all banging away like mad. Well of course it was quite different for the course, there were about 20 on the course and 50% of them were AC1 or AC2 because we'd got our sergeant stripes from radio school you see but these guys hadn't and so we were used towards the end of our course as a you couldn't call us an instructor because we didn't know how many beans meant five you know really really <coughs> but there's one I do remember and he was a fair haired young lad and he was well, about five one, five two, I would think. And he went up 
and I was his instructor, mind you. I'm not passed out as an air gunner. I haven't finished the end of the course. But what we were doing was making sure that they knew what to do if you had a stoppage. Have you seen a, you've seen a Browning and seen the cocking stud? Well, if you fire and the gun stops, and it stops with a cocking stud right forward, you cock and fire again. If it's a number two stoppage with the stud halfway back, cock and fire again. If it's a number three stoppage with the breech block right at the back, you can't cock it, can you? So what you did was get your cocking toggle and ram it underneath and release the rear sear and it would go forward and fire and then it would go again. Oh, this young lad, without asking, he had a number three stoppage. So he couldn't cock it, could he? So he lifted the breech cover, the, re the breech block went forward, fired, and he had a black face and no eyebrows. <laughs> and I said to him, for God's sake, I, what did we discuss before we took off? He said, oh no, I made a mistake, didn't I? I said, yeah, probably the end of your course too. But I don't know whether that was fact mm. or not, because he'd got a black face, you see. <laughs> where, where the thing went off, he got a black face. And his eyebrows were a bit dodgy. <laughs> but I passed out on that course, and then I was posted to... Uh, I think I went to Madley then for a refresher to number four radio school at Madley down near Hereford. And then uh, we were posted on block then. You're not going to believe this. Northern Ireland to Bishop's Court which was number eight advanced flying unit. We finished there and had a leave. <coughs> so I went home on indefinite leave and I was home for two and a half weeks, I suppose. And uh, a telegram came and it said, report to number 21 operational training unit at Morton in Marsh. So I caught the train to Oxford changed there and went to Morton and we did uh, a sort of a two weeks refresher on all the things that you had done in the previous weeks but the pilots didn't do that they had carte blanche to go and listen to all these different classes and then at the end of the two weeks we went into the hangar for tea and sticky buns and these pilots would come and decide who they would like as their wireless hop, air gunner. The only one you didn't there, there were no flight engineers, you see, on Wimpies. So you didn't get your flight engineer till much later. And uh, this bloke came and he was about, well, to me, I'm only a short lad. He looked about six foot 12 to me. And he came up and he said, my name's Flying Officer Robertson, I need a wireless up. And uh, I thought, well, what, what can I say? The commissioned officer, and I'm a buck sergeant, I can't say nothing bloody well coming with you, <laughs> you know. I don't know what he's like. And he said, yeah, I'd like you as my wop. He said, come and meet the mess of the crew. So uh, I went and met, and, and there was that was flying off to Robertson. He came from Brandon near Winnipeg. So I went with him, and we got guy this up. He said, "This is Tip Tyler, the navigator. He's from Toronto. The bomb name was Garfield Cross. He comes from Vancouver, North Shore. There's Jerry Marion. He's a mid upper, and Ed Ray is a rear gunner. So I thought, well, there I am, flight sergeant in a Canadian crew." What's, uh, what's it going to be like, you know? Because there were very few uh, Canadian wireless ops on the course. And I thought, well, I wonder why, you know? Is it just one of those, there are guys ready, so they just push them in. But we did, uh, did our circuits and bumps, or as they were known as circuits and crash landings. And... Uh, we got along fine, you know, we got along really well. But uh, I don't know what they thought 
you know, the, the other rest of the crew ever thought. It, it was in my mind that, they, why did we have to have an English WAP? And I found out afterwards that uh, if you wanted a good WAP, have an RAF one, because their, their training in Canada was nowhere near up to the scratch that we were. Mm. And uh, I can't remember how many weeks we were there, but we, we did uh, circuits and landings, day and night bombing, uh, day and night cross country, um, single engine flying. It, you really did work hard. At OTU you, you worked really hard. And uh, we passed out on the course. Uh, but we did lose the navigator. He could not cope with night flying. And I thought, well, you must have done it at AFU, you know. But Skipper was good. He was, he was really good. And I found out afterwards that he was regular Air Force. He was an armourer before the war and remustered to air crew at the outbreak of war. Mm. And uh, from there, we were posted as a crew because you were posted as soon as you passed out as a crew. You didn't wait for the other guys on the course. When you passed, you went. And we went to number six group battle school at Dalton, up near Thursk. And there it was escape and evasion training. And uh, take you out on the Yorkshire moors in the middle of the night and chuck your hands and find your way home. And they took your cap away from you. So you, an airman without a cap sticks out like a sore thumb, doesn't it? So uh, we did we did quite well. Uh, but it, it, some of the capers and blokes got up to were unbelievable. They really were. Two blokes came in on a cart horse with their battle dress jackets turned inside out so you couldn't see anything, sitting astride a bloody cart horse and tied it up outside flying control and said, there you are, we're home. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> from there, we went just down the road to Topcliffe, 1659 Heavy Con Unit. And that's when it began to get serious. Um, and that's where we picked up our engineer. So they had had, we'd had quite a while together and he must have felt like an interloper because we were all on very friendly terms. <clears throat> but as I said, we lost the navigator. He could not cope with, with uh, night flying in England where he, you couldn't see anything. And you couldn't go down and read the name of the station on the grain silo. Because my skip said that that was done in Canada a lot. If they found a railway line, they'd just go down low and read what it said on the on the grain silo. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, wasn't it? Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then uh, we passed out. Uh, oh, we had we lost that navigator. We lost the next one, and then we had a jock, Tom Laurie from Orkney Lake. Navigation was second nature to him. And we, we did some really serious training and got some really serious good marks. This was at Heavy Conversion Unit? At Con Unit, yeah, we used to do long... What, what were you flying? Had you gone on to Halifaxes? Halifax 3s uh, and 5s. At the Conversion Unit? 2s uh, and 5s at yeah. Con Unit. Yeah. Long cross countries, a lot of night flying. And... Uh, we passed out and they said, right, you're posted. 158 Heavy Bomber Squadron, which was only just down the road, almost the most easterly of all bomber stations in Yorkshire, because we always set course from Flamborough Head. You, you know, it's always east, east to west takeoff, isn't it, into the prevailing wind. But then as soon as you were able, and if it was clear, you could see Flamborough Head, so you could set course previous if you liked instead of going right on to the head and most of it was just straight down the North Sea then 
So on the night in question, we uh, we took off. S 17.01 we took off uh, with a full bomb load on, somewhere about full bomb load for the distance and that we were travelling because as you know it's not such a big bomb load as a Lancaster but we could take 10,000 pounds at a push because we had two wing bomb bays you know on the Halley between the uh, two inboard engines and the fuselage we had two 500 pounders in that one and two 500 pounders in that one so you can say somewhere about 10,000 pounds was average to uh, sort of northern central Germany. Any farther than that, and you would t take the uh, four bombs out the wings and put overload tanks on. But they were a good aeroplane. I I liked Halley, and they were they were much more comfortable. I thought for the wireless up than uh, than a half than a lank. Have you seen the layout of a tally inside? Uh, I've been through the one at the Imperial War Museum. Mm -hmm. and I think that's yeah. I think that's a seven. Right. Okay. I don't know. It was it was quite different. All the Canadians had sevens up in six bomber group. They because uh, we would tank take off on tanks one and three and fly for so long, then shut off tanks one and three and open the cocks on two and four, fly for a stipulated time and then go back and train, change onto one and three and drain them tanks and then go back onto two and four and you've still got tanks five a bit left but on a, apparently a friend of mine who lives up in Newton Longville village, he was on the Canadian squadron and uh, they had a common sump everything drained into one so you didn't have to keep going and changing the cocks over to get on the right tank and the right fuel. But uh, on threes we had uh, that regime of changeover cocks and the changeover cocks were in the rest bay. But it, it didn't seem to bother people. Mm -hmm. Anyhow this night we not in question, we took off and we set course from Flamborough Head and we crossed the Dutch coast on time, on track. Um, and I'd got, have you seen Fishbond? I'm aware of Fishbond. You know what Fishbond yeah. is. Well, we were fairly well up in the stream, one of the highest, I would think, of the Halleys, because I could see a lot of dots on my screen and I didn't know what they were, were they uh, the bombers in the stream or were they fighters and uh, so what you look for is to the, say pick out three or four dots and if they stayed stationary relative to you they were other bombers in the stream but if you've got one that was dobbing about faster than you you've got a fighter in amongst you but I didn't know I, I didn't have a clue because I was because we used to listen to a group broadcast every half hour and you must listen to that broadcast. Now in between those segments uh, you were given about that much of your receiver dial to search. So you just go backwards and forwards and then don't forget to switch over because there may be a recall or diversion or something from the group broadcast. So in between these 10 minute segments, you would be searching. And what you would hear if you were unlucky enough to get caught up in the mess, what you would hear is, uh, Achtung Nachtjäger, Achtung Nachtjäger. And that was a German night fighter controller vectoring the fighters into the bomber stream. But what you would do then is to tune your transmitter exactly to the frequency you were travelling on, throw a switch and press your Morse key. And then on that frequency would be transmitted the noises of the starboard outer engine. So you're blowing off the air. So he would then go and look for somebody else. But that was... 
that was basically what you were wanting to do all the time was to keep the fighters on the hop. Whether it worked as it didn't work in our case, did it? No. But the next thing I knew was that all hell was let loose. It sounded like somebody throwing gravel on a tin roof. And we didn't know then, <coughs> instead of this bloke sneaking down below us, he was, because I have met him, the guy that shot us down. Well, we were just doing a Christmas card to him, weren't we, Ruth? Well, you do, yes, yeah. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, I thought, what the hell was that? The camera shell went up through the floor. And I don't know, but I had a sharp pain just there. But, but I was so bloody cold because it was about minus 18, 19 at uh, about 18,000. But that, that was, it was, what saved me was my flying boot. It was, yeah, there was blood, but it was nothing to speak about, you know. You weren't aware that you were under attack until didn't suddenly... Know, didn't tell no and the bangs and thumps started. Right. And, and she caught fire above the bomb bay. Yeah, it was yeah. double deck and there was a half bulkhead there which had my 1154-55 and my fish pond and my 1196 all bolted on. And my key here. Was it the pilot who said, right, that's it? Yeah. Right, he said that. I have no control. Uh, it was in a shallow dive, but it, he, he couldn't do anything with it. Couldn't pull it out, couldn't turn it. Just said, I have no control. It's time to go. So I scrabbled out of my seat, pulled my telephone jack out. So I didn't want to go out there. <laughs> and I lifted the hash and it sort of, you know, sometimes if you get a square, square tin, with a dead square lid, it tickles over that way, doesn't it? And it won't come either way. <coughs> so I'm pushing and shoving with this thing, and Jock must have been getting a bit excited. What's he buggering about that? <laughs> and he stumped on me, and I went out hatch and all. So I let that thing go, and then pulled the ripcord, and there is the most god awful jolt when it opens. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, went out and I went through a layer of cloud and then as, as we were dropping, as I was dropping, I thought, bloody hell, this is a dangerous occupation because I could hear Merlins coming and going and I could hear Hercules coming and going and I'm dangling on the end of the rope. I thought, well, what do you hope? I hope he's got his night vision goggles on. But the, uh, I went through a layer of cloud and then I saw two perfectly straight lines as I came out of the second layer of cloud. And I thought, well, the shiny one's the river or canal. And I don't want to go in there, so I'm trying to, you know, do the training to make it spill one side and move you across. And I thought, God, I am, I'm going in the river. And I hit the ground and the ground was very hard. It wasn't a river at all, it was a main road. And it was, being as it was shiny, it was like a sheet of glass. And the chute opened up again with the wind and I'm going on my backside down the road on the ice and I managed to spill it. And uh, I thought, well, the best thing now is to get out of all this. So I and hit it and I buried my shoot and uh, my harness because it was it was like a big forest with this how did I get lucky and not finish up in one of them trees because it was a big forest with big trees and I went down the road on my backside and I managed to spill it and then I buried it in the, in amongst the trees there were a lot of dead branches so I just pushed it as good as I could and I thought well now we, which way do you go, Bromfield? Because 
having spun round in the in the chute, you know, it it was difficult to orientate yourself. And I stood and I thought about it. And I heard these aircraft going and I thought, well, we were going north to south to the start of the bombing run. So these noises are starting there and going there. So if we're going south, that must be north, so that must be west. So I just walked, and I walked until daylight, and I didn't see a single soul. All I heard were aeroplanes going home, and you could hear the raucous noise of the German night fighter engines, J-88s. They had a very sort of rough sort of noise, and I thought, well, I'm going westerly, and uh, I th when it got daylight, I thought it's time to hide. So I went into the, unfortunately, that night, I didn't, I didn't very often wear it. I got my Sidcut suit on. Normally I used to wear the other one, the Kapok. It was a bit warmer, but this night, for some reason or other, I got my Sidcut suit on. So I used that. I didn't walk in it, it was too cumbersome. I used that on the ground with some pine branches and had a rest. And when I got, when I woke in the morning, there was a watery sort of sun there and I thought well you're going the right way Bromfield you know you sussed that out and I didn't know have a clue where I was or what I was doing but when it was really daylight I got my Pandora's box out you knew what was in there did you you know you silk map and your compass and all the rest of it and compass was out yeah compass and going in the right direction and uh, I thought well shall I walk the road or shall I walk in the woods and I thought because I was walking at night hiding up in the daytime and I thought well if I am going the right way. What I want is some sort of definite marker as to where I was. And reading one of those maps in, in even in daylight is bad enough. But I did find after I, a railway line crossed, no no level crossing, nothing. Just the, the railway line just went across this road. So I thought, well, that road is probably a farm road, you know, or could be army, could be a military road of some sort because there were no crossing gates. And uh, so I picked up this railway line, which was going good enough west. And I kept wondering about, you know, how many days had I been, so I got some, some pebbles and I just put one in my pocket at the end of every day <coughs> and uh, I thought well why am I not coming up against any dwellings or anything I didn't see anything at all no dwellings no farms didn't hear any cattle and trying to go back in your mind and what you had done at uh, battle school but no it didn't make sense but this railway line kept going more or less west and I thought well west far enough is Holland so if I can get to the border I've got to be in with a shout and it veered off south two or three times but then it came back on course but by this time, this was about the, the seventh and eighth day, I was getting hungry. I'd had my chocolate bar, I'd had my Horlicks tablets. I'd got a pocket full of crumbs here, which used to be a packet 
of uh, digestive biscuits and I'd got a big bar of Cadbury's chocolate which was our flying ration and I thought well this is not going to last forever I've got to get some food somewhere do you know what a potato clamp is? well when even before the war we used to do it was to put all your swedes or rudibarkers or your spuds in a triangular shape and then cover it over with turf and that's how they kept their spuds and swedes through the winter and that well how we did and I thought well do they do the same so I went up to this one just off this small track and I started scratching about in the bottom of it and sure enough there were the spuds but a raw spuds better than nothing isn't it and when I was sort of stuffing them inside my battle dress jacket there was something hard and round in my back and a voice said handy hock so I thought well I'd better handy hock and there's this little fat man with a 12 ball shotgun and he was the station master stupid had not looked around that stand of trees there was the clamp there were the trees the railway line went down there and there was a small station just single track railway and he is getting all excited by then <coughs> so <coughs> we took me it was signal box come ticket office you name it it, it did everything and uh, he picked up one of the old wind-up telephones and it was me still standing at the end of the box like this and he's hopping about from one leg to the other <laughs> I think he would certainly get the iron cross for this <laughs> and a man and a woman turned up in uh, you would call it a jeep really it was a sort of open back little truck and uh, they told me to sit down in the chair. And they put my hands behind my back and tied my hands behind my back. And I said, no, Geneva Convention, you do not shackle the prisoner because the woman smoked good English. And she said, we are not interested in the uh, Geneva Convention. If I tie your hands, I tie your hands. Well, there was a lot of toing and froing and winding the old telephone up, and then I think it was a second off the production line, VW Beetle, with canvas seats like a like a deck chair in it, and they came and they took me to the nearest outpost, which was a lookout post on top of a hill, manned by the Luftwaffe. Well, they did, they were benevolent lads, they were. They gave me a slice of bread and a cup of ersatz coffee. And then another two characters came up and they took me to the town and chucked me in the local nick. And uh, I was in the local nick for about two days. And then uh, two more blokes came up in another beetle and I was taken to an airfield. I found out it was Depols, which was a German night fighter station. And uh, it, it was really funny in the way, you know, it was, I was in no laughing matter, but this was funny because all the other guys I found out that were in the other cells were all, they were all on jankers. They were absent from leave and drunk on duty and all sorts of things and there was one guy who brought me a bowl of porridge <clears throat> and I tried to make him understand where are we or where am I oh no 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 and uh, he was on jankers and he was he was one of the I think he was behaving himself so he got a fair bit of freedom but he did put a piece of paper in my hand with defaults in it 
and I thought, well, I don't know where default is, for Christ's sake, but I know I'm now in the hands of the Luftwaffe, so probably I'll get a better deal than the Wehrmacht or the SS or whoever. I had three days in the cell, and then uh, this guy turned up. I thought he was going to win World War II all by himself. He had got a uh, you know, Schmeischer and a rifle and a pistol. He got a Luger in his back pocket. Come on, Zimit. So we go, and we walked, and we walked, and we walked, and eventually we came to a railway station. We got on the train, and where we went, I haven't the vaguest idea. But when we got to the other end, I knew where I was. I was at Dulag Luft at Frankfurt. And there I was given a cup of Ersatz coffee and chucked in the cell. And the cell was about that wide and just long enough to get a, a cot in it. And there were no doorknobs, nothing. If you wanted to go, you turned a knob and a little signal arm fell outside that you wanted to go. And so they would leave you until you were absolutely bursting and then they would and there was a bucket in there for the night time you didn't turn the handle at night <laughs> there was a bucket and the interrogation was something else but they didn't need to ask me if some of the books I'd got on the desk had got markings on of squadrons and anything you wanted to know they're, they're Intelligence service must have worked overtime. They, they didn't need to ask me, it was all there. But one thing that did peeve me, when I joined up, I'd never owned a watch in my life. My mum bought me a little ticker tick Timex. So they took my watch off me and chucked it into a box. You could have taken your pick of all the sorts of watches that were in this box. And then they searched me, and then in my top pocket they found my... Because wireless ops were issued with a pocket watch, you know. Not like the NAV, who was issued with a really posh wish but with a moving bezel. <coughs> uh, what they'd got in there, fountain pens, cigarette lighters, that every bloke had been stripped. And I spent about four days in there and most of the time was interrogation where do you come from what aircraft were you flying shrug your shoulders they get a bit peevish now and again but don't push them too far you know but if you told them rubbish they knew you must be they knew their intelligence must have been absolutely brilliant or some guys had spilled the beans under duress you know, you didn't know. I wonder if you can recall some of the interrogation techniques that they used on you when you were at Dulag Lift. Oh, uh, just continual asking questions and poking and prodding and telling you, you know, we have the rest of your crew and all this sort of thing. We, the rest of the crew have, have told us what we want to know and all this. Had you had training to expect that? Oh yes, when we were at uh, battle school we had all the information. <coughs> Some guys who made a home run, they were instructing at uh, battle school to tell you what to expect. So you knew quite a bit of what they were trying to do. Did you ever feel badly threatened that uh, your life was in danger at any time as a prisoner? Yeah, there was one guy, he was... Well, most of, most of these guys, they were all little stocky men. But this, he was six foot two, three, he was, but he was quite snotty. We can't have you shot, you know, and all this business going on all the time. Mm. But sometimes, yeah, you did feel that you'd pushed them a bit too far or just shrugging your shoulders when they asked you a question. And in, in your travelling from Dulagluth 
to Bath through Frankfurt and that. Did you did you come across any civilian hostility? Did you experience? Oh any? yes. On uh, well, the first place I went to with this little guy all on my own, we went to Hanover. And that was a mess. And the sirens went. See, the bomber come out, going to wind them up again, and Bromfield's in the middle of it. But yeah, there was civilian animosity, you know, pushing, and the worst bit is being spat on. But you can understand, you know, you've just been and flattened their street. And, and you were under protection, I guess, by the guards, of course, stopping any civilian... He didn't bother. I was rescued. I, I, <coughs> I don't know how Luftwaffe insignia goes, but he had something here that looked like wings, and I didn't, I didn't speak German at all, uh, but uh, I got the gist of the message from him to the other guy, it is your job to get him to wherever, not let him, he may have valuable information and that's what we want, not you letting these people do as they like. That was what I sort of understood that was going on, whether it was fact or fiction, I don't know, but I thought that was what was he was saying, you know, get him out of here and get him to where he's supposed to be going. And um because it was obvious who I was, because the story, the tale was, don't cut your insignia off and try and make a civvy suit out of a battle dress. Be captured as a prisoner of war. Yeah. Did you feel at, um, at this stage, the Germans, your interrogators and your guards, that they still believed they could win the war? <coughs> the... Uh, Senior officers in the in uh, Dulag and in the camp, they they still believe they could win. Do you think they? Do you think that was just a front they were putting on that they genuinely thought? We often discuss this in the billet. You know, are they trying to cajole the hoi polloi? You know, the privates and corporals and sergeants to you know we're still in with the shout. So then we were marched out and we were marched down into the station and there was a, a train there and right in the middle we found out it was an ammunition train and right in the middle were four French cattle trucks and it had on the side 40 Homs 8 Chevaux. 40 men or 8 horses. We had 4 days in that bloody thing. If only somebody had had a camera, especially a cine camera. Because at daybreak every day the train stopped and we were put out on the side of the track to drop your trousers and do whatever you wanted to do and then pull up your keks again and back in the train. If somebody had had all the three wagons with 40 men in each, 120 men all stooping down on the side <laughs> of the railway track. And uh, <clears throat> oh, God knows how long it took on the train. You were oblivious to time, because nobody had got a watch. You didn't know what was going on. You just knew this bloody train rattled on. And the next thing I know, we're at a place, um, Bath, B-A-R-T-H. We found out that that was Stalag Luft 1. And the station was, was quite away from the camp, so we, 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 did, we didn't march, we slouched. Some blokes were in a bad way. Some blokes had got dirty old bandages on them. You know, it was degradation. And I think that was their attitude, you know, we'll make them wish they had never come on this caper. And uh, so we were marched into the 
Salag Luft One was a big camp, and there was a north compound there, and a west compound there, and where they joined was a German Vorlager, which was their administrative offices, living quarters, canteens. But we had, and I was chucked into the north compound. And it was American. They were all Americans. Now the rooms were about, well, if you could lay six men down, side by side. That was how long it was, that way and this way. And there were 24 men in that room, so we'll say that's the wall. There would be, because you didn't have a bed, you slept on a shelf next to one another, with boards that had got gaps in between, because some idiots had been taking the odd board for a tunnel, you see, now and again. <clears throat> so there would be six men there, six, six and six, and then in this corner, two, two and two. So there were 24 men living in a room about half this size. Mm -hmm. Roll call every morning at uh, about an hour after daybreak. <clears throat> but that used to take forever because You've heard the story before, haven't you, where guys get off one end and run and get on the other end. So they're two men too many, and then the next time they're three men short, well, we've got nothing else to do, have we? Just wind them up. But the, the one I do remember, there was a little... Just inside the door on the bottom shelf was a little blummy, brummy flight engineer. And he would get Klim tins, Klim is milk spelt backwards, which is powdered milk. And he would get two or three of them and split them open and he would make you a tray that would hold water. He was absolutely brilliant. But one thing that did wind Brummy up was the American that used to come in. Because I'll tell you, I'll get, go back a bit then. He used to come in every morning any of you guys want to trade cigarettes for D-bars? Did we want to give cigarettes for chocolate? No, we don't trade food. Bugger off. Well, that, when I was in the North Compound, it was like a pigsty. So I made an appointment, as we say, a bit more civilised, to see the senior British officer who was um, Group Captain Weir. And he said, what's your problem? I said, well, I don't like living like a pig. And he sent one of his minions out, and I was then transferred into the West Compound, into an RAF and, well, British Dominion Allied personnel. And they all kept the place clean. They swept the floor. They didn't throw fag, end, fag ends on the floor. You know, it, it was just different. It was so filthy up that other one. There you go, I couldn't, I couldn't do much about it. What time, when, when did you arrive at Bath? We've been to 1945 now. Yeah. Um, I should think January, end of February, beginning of March, I'd been from pillar to post, you know, until I right. found out what to do. So this is the winter, this very... It's, it's yeah. Yeah, bitterly cold. Mm. Well, it's got to be up on the Baltic, hasn't it? Yeah. It's not. It's not far west of Peenemunde. Right. Yeah. 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 Did at this point um, were you aware of what had happened to the rest of your crew? No, I didn't have a clue. And they thought I was brown bread, dead, mm. because the pilot, the nav, the bomb aimer, and the rear gunner were all captured the next morning. So you can see the spread where they were obviously in a populated little area, a village or something, and I was in the wilderness. Um, Jerry, the mid-upper, he was uh, in a very bad way. He got a lot of shrapnel wounds, and he wasn't looked after very well at all. 
and so we didn't know what had happened to him. Anyhow, when they marched a new intake through the gates of Luft One, everybody was standing at the wire. And now my mum had a telegram uh, the next morning uh, in that January. Uh, and say I was missing, but she didn't know until March, uh, ne the next uh, telegram was March. So they had uh, been captured the next day, they thought I was a goner. Everyone survived on the crew? Yeah, we all survived. Mm. But uh, the flight engineer got out but we're not sure how it how it all came because Doc, the one that the mid upper that's just died, we had some uh, letters from him, didn't we, Ruth, from Doc, some oh. time ago, to say that he had been on holiday and he had met this American aircrew guy and they were talking, and the Americans said, "Well, your flight engineer." That man, Dacey, he was shot trying to escape from a German hospital. But Doc was taken into a hospital, wasn't he? Doc, Doc was Doc taken was into a hospital, yeah. He had some treatment on his leg. Not, Be not that good, but he, he did have some. <clears throat> from what I could make out from him, from Doc and his wife, Anne, uh, he had got uh, shrapnel or something in his leg and it wouldn't heal and they didn't want to take it out because it was so close to uh, a nerve or whatever that he could have been paralysed for life or something yeah. and they said well if you can stick it because it will move around in your body now my dad used to tell me this, when he got brass filings in his fingers, he said it will, it will move around and eventually you'll be able to get hold of it. Because he was a great St John's ambulance man, my dad was. He said it will move around in your body. And about three or four years ago, they found it. And it was a percussion cap off a shell, <laughs> probably a 20 millimeter. And he went back to playing golf, didn't he? Really? Yeah. yeah, he did. He went back to playing golf. They took it out. <laughs> Strange world. So, so, so yes, yeah, so we, February 45, you're up at Bath. We're, yeah. Um, and then at the evac evacuation, when did that take place of, of Bath? Uh, we heard that it was all over. But um, we... The strange thing was, they, the window which looked out on the compound, uh, the windows opened in and they were steel framed windows, but the shutters on the outside opened out and they had a slot then and they dropped a bar in so you couldn't, but we could because we used to put a piece of steel in and just lift the bar up and you could open the, the shutters. And they opened the shutters this morning and standing in the compound was the biggest tank we'd ever seen. And it got a red star on the side. So the Russians. But the night before, <coughs> when we went to Kip, you know, you, you know, all these little conversations going on in the dark, and uh, they started the bangs and thumps and crashings and bangings and somebody said good hell what the bloody hell's going on now and some little voice from the darkness because there was no light at all in the room at night when she went to kip and the voice from the darkness said that's the russian guns and another voice from the darkness said they're not guns he said, how do you know? He said, I was at El Alamein, mate. I know what gunfire sounds like. <laughs> he said, well, what is it then? He said, well, they're blowing up something. They had detonation charges. And they were blowing up all the buildings outside the camp because there was an airfield, an anti-aircraft 
school for radar and what have you just outside the wire and sure enough they blew up all the buildings but they didn't blow up the runways and about what, four or five days later a squadron of B-17s joined the circuit and that so I flew home in the Bombay of a B-17 